Welcome to this short video uh, brought to you by virtue of selfishinvesting.com. Um, today's uh, topic that I want to be covering is uh, the punch bowl of death, also known as the pod, which is essentially a short selling formation or a short sale setup, an SSS, if you want to call it that, as we refer to the emails that we send out uh, regarding short sale setups from virtue of selfishinvesting.com. In any case, uh, since this is a discussion about short selling and short sale setups, I think it's helpful to just quickly review the six golden rules of short selling, uh, which I call shorting rules uh, 101. First rule, rule number one, only sell short during bear phases. That's not hard to understand. What may not be so hard to understand is this can include bear markets as well as market corrections. You know, last year in 2010, right now I'm recording this video in June of 2011. So last year in 2010, we saw from May uh, through the summer, through the middle of the summer, uh, a pretty brutal correction in the market that could have yielded some results on the short side. And in fact, that was the one period in May where I was able to be up almost 100% on the short side uh, in one month. Now, I know that sounds really nice and, and fantastic and uh, everybody wants to do that. But I should point out that the short side is very dangerous. And even still, at this point in my career, 20 plus years of investing, short selling is where I've taken my biggest losses. And sometimes uh, sitting too soon is what I found, or sitting too long, rather, or getting in too soon are the two things that uh, really cause problems uh, when on the short side and where you can really get hit. So a lot of short selling is waiting for the right window of opportunity to show up. And that's easier said than done. So you have to be persistent and you have to look at that window of opportunity opening up in conjunction with the market. And of course, that means you only sell short during bear phases or market corrections. Okay. And we want to focus on those big stock leaders that had huge price runs. Okay. In the immediately preceding bull phase. And of course, these have to be showing significant signs of topping. You don't short big stock leaders or any leading stock in an uptrend. Well, it's still an uptrend. Okay. It's got to show signs of topping and preferably showing a short sale setup of some sort. Uh, in general, and you know, this doesn't uh, include late stage failed base setups in most cases, although that's not necessarily true, but you want to wait 8 to 12 weeks following the top before you want to start shorting in stock. It takes some time to work off the bullish sentiment in any big leader. Most people look at the first major pullback in a big leader as an opportunity to come in and start buying the stock, which as we know is usually not a very smart thing to do. Uh, but an interesting thing about pod formations is that they can also provide you with some uh, guidance in terms of understanding how a stock is forming the bottom of a pod and could have a very sharp rally to the upside. But we'll get into that a little bit later. But it basically, you know, wait, wait 8 to 12 weeks following a major top. Usually the bullish sentiment has been wrung out of a stock and it's ready to come down. Okay. Only short stocks that trade a minimum of 1 million shares a day. All right, the reality here is that yeah, some stocks trade a million shares a day somewhat liquidly. If they're a $150, $200 stock, that's a nice big stock. But you know, there are some stocks, $20 stocks trading a million shares a day. That's kind of light. And when I'm shorting, I like to have a lot of what I call price point liquidity. In other words, I know I can come in and cover or short at a particular price point without moving the stock too much. Okay, If they're illiquid on a price point basis, these stocks will flip around, and I think that gives you a disadvantage on the short side. Uh, set tight stops, usually 3 to 5%. Uh, this rule comes from my experience in 2009, just not uh, paying attention to stops in terms of what I would have happening is financial stocks, which I was short at the time, gapping up 10% in the morning on you. Okay, so you're suddenly down 10% on that position. If you're 150% short, you're getting slapped around pretty good. So... Always pay attention to those stops. What I should have done in those cases, even though I was down 10%, it's more than 3 to 5%, just get out and rethink or go away. Because uh, generally when the market starts moving sharply to the upside and you're getting hit like that, you want to be backing away. So in general, we want to try to risk, uh, do, do some risk management here by maintaining 3 to 5% stops when they're not gapping against us and whether or not uh, they're gapping against us 10%. You definitely want to be out. Uh, at that point. So that also depends on your position sizing. If you're like me, I like to go in 100% short, 150% short pretty quickly. Uh, when I see something break down, it worked for me in the past, it didn't work in 2009. 
uh, sat too long and so you really want to uh, pay attention to this particular rule number five okay and if you're looking at shorting for the first time you know I would say play with five to ten percent of your capital and learn how to do it first and then prove to yourself through material results that you can actually short uh, the market and short stocks and get away with it okay and make some money because it's not that easy and because it's not so easy it, and the downside tends to be more jagged than the upside although in the QE environment we've seen since 2009 the market has had some uh, I would say equivalent volatility on the upside but in general in, in bear markets you'll break sharply and then you have these rallies uh, that jump up sharply, sharply and those can actually gut you if you're uh, late to the game or if you're not looking to take profits so I would say 15 to 30 percent profits on the downside and this is going to vary by the environment that you're in if you're in a really uh, nice trending downside uh, bear market then I think you're going to get 20 percent 25 30 percent on a lot of positions and that was possible in 2008 towards the end of the year after the market broke down uh, after September in the last quarter in some environments I noticed such as the correction of uh, last year in 2010 that was just a correction but I made a lot of money taking a lot of quick 15 20 percent profits and uh, and then hitting them again on the rallies. So, so you want to set downside profit targets, and a lot of times this occurs at logical points of support, such as a moving average. And um, we'll do another video uh, after this one showing how we might handle positions in real time on the short side. But for now, we're sticking to pods. And one of the first examples, there were a few examples in 2000 that I saw as a reba. I, uh, I played this stock in the upside. Uh, I actually caught this move at the end of. Uh, well, actually going into the beginning of, of 2000 when the market topped in March. And a pot is just a big pot, a punch bowl. It's a big cup and a big bowl, whatever you want to call it. And I just thought it looked like a big punch bowl. And from my college days, I remember things being used to spike punch bowls at parties. And I thought, well, a punch bowl of death would be something with, you know, some Everclear and maybe a few gallons of vodka and a few other fun things mixed into the punch bowl. So a punch bowl of death. Uh, is what I decided to call it because it also describes what happens when a stock have a sharp price run the market breaks down remember in March of 2000 we had a market top so it breaks down this stock was a hottie and ran like mad during the bull market of 99 into 2000 stock broke down sharply then had a nice reasonably sharp move back up you know 25 30 weeks maybe a little more is what these pods in 2000 were looking like and sometimes they can be shorter. I think the shorter ones tend to be the better ones in terms of downside velocity. But you can see Ariba had some pretty good downside velocity once he broke support at 600 on this side. But it's basically a big run, sharp break, sharp rally, and then an even bigger break after the second top. So we can kind of describe it as this. You have a sharp rally A, and this is actually AOL, uh, for those of you who can't read this. Uh, and then you have high number one, you break down, so it's an A, B move here. And then a C move to rally to high number two. D is the breakdown, and that's usually pretty shortable. You can see that in AOL. If you had shorted this breakdown, you could have done pretty well pretty quickly. And again, look at how the break through the 50-day. This is probably where you'd be trying to short it, probably on a rally back up into the 10-week 50-day moving average. That's the blue line here at 80. And say you break down to 60, and you're getting about 25% on that kind of move. So back then, I remember those were working pretty well that way. And if you look at 2008, same thing. Charles Schwab was an interesting example. It had a big move up and then a sharp breakdown for pod number one and rallied to high number two. And then it did another pod. So it was a, a double pod, and then it broke down. You can kind of get a sense of how you had a trend line here that just kind of broke down from. Uh, and I've drawn all kinds of fun lines here. But the essence here is that you have this huge price run, big breakdown, big rally back up towards the highs, and you can short that. In this case, notice that the second one was a kind of a big, ugly, sloppy cup with handle formation. Uh, Taser in 2004, 2005 was an interesting example. Remember that was big uh, because the idea was that uh, pilots would be tasing passengers, uh, husbands would be tasing wives, wives would be tasing husbands, and maybe parents might be tasing kids because everybody was going to have a taser. Uh, because who knew who knew who would be a terrorist, right? And the thing had a huge run. And you notice up at the top here, three for one, two for one, two for one, right at the two peaks. Uh, this is an example of where you get splits 
that uh, occur around the top, and when they occur in so quickly like this, within a few months of each other, right around the top, that's usually bad news. Uh, but this is a big pod, and you have two, three highs here. You could have gotten in, potentially you might have shorted here, but notice how it doesn't break the 10-week moving average, it actually holds, it tries to break out. Now when it breaks the 10-week moving average, you get a nice move down, and the thing breaks down. And notice that this also coincides with a two-for-one split, which is the third split in a year. And that's what we're talking about when you, uh, or when we're talking about excessive splits coinciding with a potential top in a leading stock. Here's Amazon in 99. That was another pod, a double pod. Now here's we have a very short pod. Okay, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 weeks in duration. A short one, very sharp break. And you see how the break there is very sharp? Now this one's a little bit longer. It has a nice break, which you can make money shorting, but it then takes some time to break down. I've noticed in my experience that when you have a very sharp move down, a very sharp move up, they'll usually break down faster. If it's a slow process, they'll take some time to break down, simply because as you're coming up the right side, you have some time to build these little consolidations which then serve as areas of support on the way down. Okay. Uh, you know, pods occurred as, as long ago from my studies as 1907. This is Reading Railroad. This is a lousy scan, but that's all I could muster up here uh, from an old paper chart I had. And you can see there's a pod there. You see that and see how it breaks down. And Reading Railroad was a hot stock in 1906, 1907. Uh, had a big move. I think Jesse Livermore played that, and he talks about it in Reminiscences of a Stock Operator by Edwin Lefevre. Uh, but, you know, this is proof here that precedents historical precedence uh, works in most cases and definitely works with respect to pods because I want you to look at this pattern very closely and what do you see? You see a couple of bottoms in here uh, it tests the bottom at uh, 116 here comes down 112 or so makes a low test the bottom 116 so it's retesting this long then takes off runs up again. Now so I kind of imprint that on your brain and look at dry ships in 2008, 2007, late 2007, topped with the market, okay? So a lot of times the first high coincides with the market, breaks down, turns around, heads back up, makes a second high, breaks down, and when it breaks down through the 10-week moving average, that's when you can really start to come after it. Uh, notice also, and believe it or not, I actually, this is the first time I played a pod on the upside, so I recognize that this was probably a pod, and since the market had followed through, I believe, back in March of 2008 for a short bear market rally, the stock ran up to the other side, and once it got above the 50, I was buying the stock, and it ran up, I sold it up in here a little bit too soon, but made some money on the position. Uh, so in this case, I used uh, understanding how a pod works, okay, and how it forms out, and put it together with the fact that the market topped here, this broke down with it, now the market was following through here, and I figured, okay, we're going to need a market rally, it's going to drag us up since it was a big leader from the previous run in 2007, it's going to turn around and break down. Uh, or it's going to run up, I'm going to play that, and then it's going to turn around and break down, and I got it on both sides. Here's a short pod, you see, uh, LDK Solar, very short one, how many weeks? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 down, 1, 2, 3 up, then boom, it breaks down. Uh, J Solar Holdings in 2008 was another one. Comes down, technically 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 weeks down, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 weeks up, then it tries to form a handle, then fails there. Notice that once it gets below the 10-week moving average, kaboom, it's done. Uh, precedent. Again, I remember Broadcom, and I was shorting Broadcom in 2000, 2001, and it was this big pod, which was this big, ugly cup with handle, and notice how this broke down. Uh, and what I noticed is this chart is actually from a piece I did in 2008, and I was describing how much this looked like for solar at the time. So let's go back. Broadcom in 2000. Look at this pattern. And it's a pod. It breaks down. Notice once it starts to get below the 50 day now, uh, 50 day, 10 week moving average is a blue line again. It takes some time because uh, Broadcom was a big hot leader and it took some time to break down. But when it did, it broke down very quickly and you could have made a, a lot of money shorting it. And it gave you uh, other opportunities as a rally back above and then broke down here. And these kind of look like also a big head and shoulders formation, but this was your pod here, and then it kind of morphed into this big, ugly head and shoulders, and this is from uh, late 2008, okay, 
And I was looking at the pattern then. And you know what happened to, to First Solar after that it broke down uh, from here and went lower, got down towards the 100 level. Uh, interestingly enough, when I made this presentation that had these charts in it, somebody who had uh, attended that or read my comments about First Solar told me they had bought uh, $44,000 worth of 200 puts or something on First Solar uh, here, and then when it got down to 100, they covered and they turned $44,000 into 1.4 million dollars. So I like to say that uh, you know, who knows? You may pick up something from uh, something that either I or Dr. K say that you're able to execute properly and make a ton of money for yourselves. And I think you know, when you take forty-four thousand dollars, turn it into one point four million dollars with an idea like shorting first solar or buying puts uh, when it's forming this pod, uh, that's a life-changing event in terms of an investment uh, that really works out and helps build wealth. And it's very gratifying for me to see that happen. Uh, Apple was another pod in 2008. You know, probably what you want to do is stop some of these, uh, uh, stop these charts in the video and just kind of look at them, pause the video, and take a look at these and just study them. Uh, IGT was a big, funky-looking pod, and it took some time to break down. And this also shows how it's not always so cut and dried. You know, you come up, you make this pod, you break below the 10-week moving average here, 10-week, 50-day, okay kind of use them interchangeably, 10 weeks on the weekly chart, 50 days on the daily chart. I think that is all quite logical. But here you have this big breakout. See, you could have been shorting here, thinking these things in a bust, but notice it comes down, undercuts these lows in here, undercuts uh, and gets close, retests this low, undercuts this area, and then comes out and just breaks down. And notice as it undercuts this low here, it, it does a little bit of fake out before it really busts apart. Uh, VeriSign is another one in 2000. Uh, I made money on the long side with this one, and then I did make some money shorting it, I believe. Uh, but look at it's a big, ugly uh, cup with handle. But really, when it starts to break down and really break below the 50-day, you get a little break here. Here it holds, and then finally, when it bre does break, it really stays underneath there. Uh, TBSI or TBS International, same situation here. Look how quick the break is off the right peak. Boom, in one week you go from 60 to 45. Uh, that's a nice move. 40%, uh, something like that. Am I looking at that right? No, about uh, 25. Yeah, about 25, 30. Uh, looking at stocks today, okay. Uh, VMware struck me. And I have to look at things both ways. You know, the one thing about investing is you never want to get rigid in how you're looking at something. If I'm thinking that VMware is viable on the basis of being a cup with handle formation, okay, I also have to be willing to look at new evidence as it occurs, not get hung up on that concept and instead understand that maybe it's also a late stage failed base uh, that is a, a little mini pod, you know. So these things... Uh, can change and, and this would be a late stage failed base that also is kind of a mini pod. So again, what I'm trying to point out here is that these things can kind of merge all together and kind of morph one into the other. So what turns out to be a cup with handle initially turns out later to become a late stage failed base. Now VMware has come down a bit uh, over the past few days. I'm recording this video on Sunday, January 5th or June 5th, rather, 2011. And uh, we'll see what happens. That could also turn around and break out. But now you, know, now you have to start looking at this in terms of applying some simple trading rules is to trade this either as a, a late stage pod or whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, sometimes you can also get faked out. Here's a pod, it breaks down. Here's another pod, it breaks out. This is Google today. But notice how sometimes patterns, this is too long in my view to be a pod. This could be a pod, but notice how what happens here, this becomes a pod, but then it forms this little cup with handle. And this is a weekly chart of Google, and this is current as of this last uh, week, not not daily, uh, not up to the day, but up to the week, because I think I, I saved this chart last week. But you see, here's a cup with handle and it fails. So that's a late stage base failure. You rally into the 50 day, break down again. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to Google, but it sure looks like it wants to go lower to me. And so you're getting the idea where, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to necessarily be a pod. Notice how you, I wouldn't look at that as a pod simply because you weren't in a big up, up move here, but. Uh, this could be seen as a pod, okay, but it didn't really turn out because then you don't have to look at it as a pod and think about it as a pod. You can now start to look at it as here's a cup with handle and it's a late stage failed base. So 
with pods, it has to have a feel of a, of a break to the downside, followed by a rapid rally back to the upside. And not so much just a big loping uh, bull type of formation. There has to be certain characters. It has to have been a very hot leader in the prior bull move. So I hope that gives you some idea of what the punch bowl of death formation is. Uh, I'll probably turn this presentation into a little article uh, that you can then refer to. Also, you can read uh, our book, Trade Like an Anil Disciple, where we talk about the short side um, in the book itself. And I devote a whole section of one chapter uh, that was done on short selling uh, to the pod. So you want to check that out. And I hope this has been helpful for all of you. Uh, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you later.